I want to thank the organizers of this conference, the university, the Catholic University of Eastern Africa, Comucap, and all those people who are involved in the project that this organization sponsors. Thank you all for participating and for being here. I will read through my paper and hopefully we can have uh, some time to chit chat about some of the things that I might say here about which you might have some concerns or about which you might want to make some expanding comments. The theme of this conference could not have come at a more crucial time. Crucial because we are almost compelled to think about it. The times are compelling because these are the times when the humanities, the humanistic sciences, also called simply as humanities, are threatened in many places across the globe by organizations and governments that traditionally have supported them or have been at the apex of their growth over the past nearly a century. On June 8, 2015, the Japanese Minister of Education, Hakuban Shimoru, Shimoru, Shimomura, issued a dictum in a letter to all Japanese universities and colleges, ordering them to eliminate all programs in the humanities and the social sciences. As a result, by, by September of the same year, more than 26 of Japan's 60 universities announced that they would reduce or altogether eliminate their academic programs in these disciplines in order, according to the dictum, to focus on the disciplines that, I quote, better meet society's needs, unquote. The minister's letter encouraged Japan's institutions of higher education to take active steps to abolish these programs or convert them to scholastic opportunities in the natural sciences. In Japan's case, the subjects affected included law and economics, not just your traditional humanities subjects. Of the 26 universities agreeing to comply with the ministerial dictum, 17 would no longer recruit students to study them. The minister claimed in his letter that his idea was utilitarian in vision and in line with the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's drive to reassert Japan's economic and political stature in the world. This vision says in part that, I quote, rather than deepening academic research that is highly theoretical, we will conduct more practical vocational education that better anticipates the needs of society, unquote. And that students in those subjects should instead be directed to study software programming for bookkeeping in a growing industry that so much depends on technology. The universities of Tokyo and Kyoto, Japan's two in the top 100 in world rankings of universities and colleges, rejected the directive, while Mr. Takamitsu Sawa, the president of Shiga University, wrote in an op-ed in Japan Times that the order was outrageous and anti-intellectual. He wrote that, I quote, Academics contribute to the creation of an intellectually and culturally enriched society. We see it as our duty to produce, enhance, and transfer in-depth and balanced accounts of knowledge about nature, human beings, and society. Thus, the humanistic and social sciences make an essential contribution to academic knowledge as a whole. Just this year, the American Philosophical Association, the African Studies Association there, alongside other humanities-based professional organizations, sent out an alert that Trump administration had drawn up a national budget blueprint that would eliminate the National Endowment for the Humanities, NEH, along with the National Endowment for the Arts, NEA, International education programs, such as the Popular Fulbright Program, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and other international scholarship programs from which international educational exchanges 
are for so long dependent. These eliminations underscore the belief that knowledge as produced in the humanities and the social sciences, all as advanced through exhibits of historical and cultural achievements of people across the world, are no longer deemed significant to how humans view each other through their respective achievements, or that such views of knowledge or knowledge no longer really matter. Yet it is through such knowledge and forging of mutual respect of diversity of respective contributions to the global human heritage that we can make significant steps toward eliminating discrimination as we increase mutual respect across nations and across cultures because we come to know each other better. A similar outcry has been heard in this country, Kenya, when politicians have made irresponsible statements to the effect that subjects in the humanities and the social sciences are no longer considered important to how higher education should be understood and financed at public universities and colleges. What we should be thinking about in the order of priorities is then whether subjects like philosophy have any role at all in our lives alongside with other humanities subjects. We are drawn to think, therefore, what would happen to a world of technicians who cannot think critically about what they do, let alone about much else. What we do not have to go far at all to look for answers to these questions from the utterance of such statements in the first place. While it is true that everyone thinks because it is our nature to do so, much of our thinking left to itself can be biased, distorted, partial, uninformed, or drawn downright prejudiced. The quality of our life and that of what we produce, make or build, depends precisely on the quality of our thought. Surely thinking can be costly, both in money and quality of life. But excellence in thinking does not come by nature. It must be systematically cultivated through the teaching of the right subjects that address different aspects of thought and showing where they habitually go wrong and how to detect such missteps in thought. In other words, critical thinking is the art of our habitually exercised ability to analyze and evaluate thinking with a view to improving it. So, who is a well-cultivated critical thinker then? What is she or he deemed to be capable of doing that others may not be able to do? A well-cultivated critical thinker, one, raises vital questions and problems, formulating them clearly and precisely, regardless of what field they work in. Two, gathers and assesses relevant information using abstract ideas to interpret it effectively. Three, comes to well-reasoned conclusions and solutions testing them against relevant criteria and standards. Four, thinks with open mind within alternative systems of thought, recognizing and assessing, as need be, their assumptions, implications, and practical consequences. And five, communicates effectively with others in figuring out solutions to complex problems. And we teach students across the fields. I don't know what happens now in this country, but in places where I work, it does not matter whether a student is going to be a medical doctor or an engineer. They are forced to take certain general education courses, including courses in philosophy, before they can branch off to their areas of specialization or majors. Critical thinking is, in short, self-directed, self-disciplined, self-monitored, and self-corrective thinking, while being open to critiques from others in the form of dialogue that helps to grow knowledge in general. It requires rigorous standards of excellence and mindful command of their use, while being open to the humble realization of 
the natural human limitation and fallibility. It entails effective communication and problem-solving abilities and a commitment to overcoming our native egocentrism and sociocentrism, which are the biggest causes of biases and discrimination. It requires no overemphasis that these are the parameters upon which the recognition of the other as an equal interlocutor rises in a manner that brings us all to the same level in a concerted rejection of prejudice. They are the parameters upon which we come to recognize and to respect what we and others produce, whether they are material goods or knowledge about the human condition in its different settings. Not only are these parameters of human intellectual needs obvious, they also make us realize that the humanities and the social sciences are the drivers of that acutely critical framework within and around which we place other critical human endeavors in our pursuit of knowledge of and solutions to problems arising from empirical research and inquiries. In addition to the above expectations for a critical thinker, we must also teach our young students to recognize why, why we reason. Why do we reason at all? Reasoning, we must make them recognize, has a few but critically important characteristics that we all need as human beings. All reasoning has a purpose. Every good thinker must keep their purpose clearly before them at all times and to check periodically whether, as they go about their task, they are still within the focus of their purpose and that it is kept clear of other possibly related purposes. Two, all reasoning is an attempt to figure something out, to solve a problem, or to settle a question, all of which must be stated clearly for the train of thought to be kept on track. Three, all reasoning is based on some assumptions. Well, we cannot even start to run our ideas without them. They must be identified clearly to be, ass to be assessed for justifiability. We must check at all times whether we are just describing our assumptions or whether we are exhaustively con contrasting them to or with other assumptions that may come from elsewhere, especially from other people and cultures. All reasoning is done from some point of view. We must teach our young critical thinkers to identify their point of view from which their reasoning begins and make them recognize other points of view with a view of identifying their strengths and weaknesses as we impress upon them the value of fairness when it comes to considering different streams of thought and the value they bring to the table of knowledge and knowledge production, as I know my good friend Udarina will be talking about tomorrow. All reasoning is based on either data, correct and accurate information and evidence, or plausible justification. We must teach our young thinkers to avoid overgeneralizations and statements that are unjustifiable with any form of evidence or sound reasoning. All reasoning is expressed through and shaped by concepts and ideas, which is the real main terrain of philosophers. We must teach our young thinkers to identify their key ideas and concepts and urge them to define and explain these clearly as only distinctly clear ideas and concepts will separate our thoughts from others. So Cartesianism was never in vain at all. All reasoning contains inferences and we must teach our young thinkers to draw only those inferences that flow from their from their syllogisms 
that they have validly worked with on the basis of the criteria listed above. We must press upon our young thinkers that honesty in thought, as anywhere else in life, is paramount and must count above what we desire and like. They must draw only those conclusions that are entailed by the premises we have honestly developed in the corpus of our well-reasoned texts, or justified and well-supported assumptions. Finally, similar to the above, all reasoning leads to some implications and consequences. We must teach our young thinkers to trace carefully the implications of what follows directly from their reasoning, and what they should consider carefully all that they should consider carefully all such implications, sifting positive ones from those that may be negative or faulty. So this criteria of intellectual preparation and growth and being intellectually on the good path all the time are criteria that apply to everyone, but they are only taught within the rubrics of philosophy. So philosophers must become very useful to other people in other disciplines. We always already are, only that we do not make these, in, from an institutional point of view, requirements that everybody needs before they embark on their different paths. If these things matter to the cultivation of the human spirit and general intellectual well-being, then we need the humanities and the social sciences today far more than we probably did three decades ago, as everywhere there are signs of huge drops in our children's abilities to think critically well by deploying the criteria of good reasoning, not just here where I detect such drops when I open up digital versions of, logical, of local newspapers, but where I live and teach as well as I compare quality of assignments, essays, between now and 20 years ago. The irony is that these drops are in line with the rise of pop in popularity of use of digital technology as the primary medium of communication, as the Japanese Minister of Education had so, so wrongly stressed in his dictum that I referred to at the beginning. Then think for a moment what kind of a people wants to live without claiming a heritage from their past, and without hoping to leave something for future generations. Those who call for the elimination of the humanities claim that it is fine not to have a heritage when they make utterances that call for the elimination of the teaching of history, for example, as part of the humanities or the social sciences, depending on where you are, because many people define history differently. Indeed, many of us know that the human achievements of our common past tell us much about earlier cultures, both in their differences and in their similarities, not only among themselves, but also with our own. A study of the literature of the past, both as its direct recording or its enacted representations in literature, gives us a glimpse into the problems of those who went before us, into their preoccupations and into their aspirations as filtered through the words of scholars as well as those of storytellers who reframe the events and values of their times in artistic forms. From the study of such documents, in addition to, a, to archives where they exist, we learn both about the culture of the past generations and something about the human spirit as it struggled with such perennial issues like justice, leadership, struggles with territory, settlements, loyalty, and collective care and responsibility, as well as respect for rights. Above all, we learn where and why our ancestors may have made mistakes. In other words, through the study of history, we get into dialogue with our ancestors across the ages. In the study of past cultures, both recent and ancient, we see the roots of our own. 
And these things are important. This is how humanity grows. This is how generations build on each other. Why should we do away with them? Only after we have looked at the fate of the humanities and the social sciences as a package can we then proceed to ask the question, what can philosophy in particular do for us? It goes without much labor in the understanding that the role of philosophy in the context of the tradition, such as inherited by our brothers and sisters in religious institutions, has always defined itself. And that is that philosophy is, for the same, for the same virtues of critical thinking that we have listed above, required for the exfoliation of theological enigmas that form the basis of their core training in the humanities. That there, philosophical training is required to prepare the mind for the rational foundations, from a human perspective, that is, for access to the higher revealed truths. It is true that African religious, religious heritage, sorry, inherited, sorry, African religious, that is the people, inherited this relation between philosophy and theology long before the matter of philosophy in Africa was placed in the critical lane. Whether those who headed the mission from abroad actually believed that African novitiates were well mentally endowed to do this is yet to be debated. But their position, the degree to which they might have been skeptical, was foregrounded by temples now famous or infamous, depending on who you read, text on Bantu Philosophy of 1945, English translation 1959. Once published, Temple's work allowed a return to the European pasts that had directly denied historical relevance, let alone philosophical ability to Africans. Hegel specifically became an, sorry, an object of revisionary criticism. That criticism was largely misguided and unnecessary, in my view. Here is what Francis Abiola really says of the situation, I quote, associated with the cultural malaise of assimilation was the negative image of Africa that was constantly projected by the Western texts in which was based much of the education of the Francophone African elite. The ideological thrust of these texts is exemplified by the work of Pierre Wauti of 1988 and other writers associated with the so-called colonial novel. Their perspective helped to propagate the idea of Africa as a landscape whose inhospitable nature was reflected in the savage disposition of its indigenous populations. This literature was the symbolic expression of a European ethnocentrism that had been given philosophical respectability by Hegel, who excluded African continent from his conception of world historical process and the unfolding of the universal mind, the foundations of his philosophical system." Unquote. Other contributors to the literature in the same category as Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of world history introduction referred to by Irene, and all visitors to this ideology include Arthur de Gobineau, Essay sur l'inégalité de race humaine of 1984, and Lucien Levy Brewer, de Fonction Mentale dans les Sociétés Inferiores of 1912, and Le Mentalité Primitive of 1922. The publication of Bantu philosophy initiated a counter discourse at the center of which was the, supposed, was the supposed reclamation of philosophy to and for the African mind. In what has been pejoratively referred to by Pana Pontrumji as ethnophilosophy, philosophy found a new role. It became the defining characteristic of humanity. Suddenly, in other words, the idea was that Africans would not be human enough unless they had a philosophy. And they were human only because they had a philosophy. To give Muntrongi some credit, philosophy had never been used to serve this role. The corpus of philosophical thought had not until then been synonymous with popular, popular beliefs. Not had it been, nor had, nor had it been anonymous like ethnophilosophers claimed for it. Indeed, 
Philosophy had risen precisely to challenge popular beliefs that were not rationally accounted for. In case philosophy was naturalized, in our case, philosophy was naturalized to the extent that it required no arguments at all. Indeed, to be sure, Africans have some wonderful beliefs that can save the world and the earth if we could elaborate on them. I know, for example, a community belief that shedding another person's blood is an abomination regardless of the circumstances, self-defense included. But it is only recently that I have been involved with a doctoral dissertation at the University of London that someone identified and elaborated philosophically the deontological principles that seem to explain the belief in relation to what she called alternative justice mechanisms for conflict resolution and lasting peace building. Offering for that matter, therefore, a suggestion that those people who study law might wonder whether there is not a better African understanding of jurisprudence. What is the purpose of law? What roles does law have in society? And we might find if we cared to think very hard and critically, like I have suggested, that we do not often promote law or emphasize law on the basis of the importance of retribution, but probably for something better, which this young lady that I supervised, co-supervised and examined at the University of London was arguing for, which is that African law emphasizes restoration and peace, of peace and order and societal or collective well-being above all and better still than retribution. Let me make an exception of a, move, of a movement and some of its greatest proponents. This is negritude as developed by Leopold Sedesingor from Jean Paul Sartre's pioneer characterization of, of it as a philosophical reawakening in new times of ancestral voices dimmed and zombied by colonial domination. Again, to quote from Milan, Senghor's conception of negritude both enlarges upon Sartre's definition and gives it a new orientation. Rather than a contingent factor of black collective existence and consciousness as with Sartre, for Senghor, this aspect corresponds to what he calls subjective negritude. The concept denotes for Senghor an enduring quality of being constitutive of the black race and exempt from the exigencies of the historical process. Hence, Senghor's definition of negritude as a sum total of African cultural values. His theory of negritude takes the form of an exposition of the African's distinctive manner of relating to the world, appropriately appropriating Levy Brule's notion of participation. Senghor accords primacy to emotion as distinctive of an African mood of access to the world, where emotion becomes a mood of apprehension or becomes an epistemological factor. A capturing of integral being, body and consciousness by the determinate world, unquote. Here is a difference between Senghor and the philosophers. He owned the elaboration of what he believed were the differences between Western knowing and black Africans' way of knowing. It really does not, it does some dis disservice to him by contending that he, Senghor that is, is articulating an alternative theory of mind without criticizing the resultant racialized theory thereof as unworkable. According to V.Y. Mudimbe, the legacy of Levi Proulx posited a radical difference between the West, characterized by a history of intellectual and spiritual reasoning and primitives, whose life, the Weltanschauung and thinking, were viewed as having nothing in common with the West. Like I have said before, Temple's Bantu philosophy was part of this legacy of radical difference that was rationalized by Senghor, making the difference a natural rather than a cultural one. But the 20th century is far more challenging than we have thought about and tried to deal with. 
and to try to deal with it as we have tried to ache a place within it for ourselves. The challenges lie in just how we have dealt with some of its problems beyond those of identity and whether or not our cultures have in them inbuilt philosophies. Some of the more pressing questions relate to how we have dealt with such issues as freedom, justice, poverty, democracy, responsible leadership, disease, including those that became epidemics and cultural challenges like human sexuality and sexual orientations, among others. What have philosophers offered as intellectual visions and insights on these problems, even as some of them were problematized as ingrained on the same platform of a philosophy of difference? Seeking autonomy as part of the idea of freedom from the West opened up room for authoritarianism, authoritarianism or dictatorship, as only a few individuals claimed monopoly of the right political path to deliverance from societal evils. Was it not on the same claim of unanimity of thought as once claimed by the philosophy that dictators arose under the banner of nationalism and one-party systems? We cannot hide from responsibility as conspirators to this ill by encouraging the suppression of responsible individual critical thought, which we started with, and as so powerfully pointed out by Irele in his very magisterial introduction to the second edition of Hontonji's now famous anti-ethnophilosophical text, African Philosophy, Myth and Reality. For people who have championed unanimity, we were left powerless to challenge abuse of power because our support for unanimity and the naturalized view of philosophy left us no room to challenge that which usurped our potential, different voices and visions into one. In the preface to the new edition of, this, of his own book, Hontonji himself asks, apparently in reply to some of his critics, I quote, what is, what is it to be an African? Is it belonging to a race, in this case the black race? If we decide, to restrict ourselves to black Africa? Should one, to be an African, share in a common culture and adhere to the value system or systems conveyed by this culture? Must one profess a given religious or political credo?" Unquote. In reply to himself, Antonji says a few lines later, referring to Saint Franz Fanon, no attempt must be made to encase a man, for it is his destiny to be set free." Unquote. I have never assumed that such a person should necessarily be a great African philosopher, says. But on the other hand, I see no reason why she or he should a priori be denied being a philosopher and being an African. The realm of the thinkable is immense, and that is a very powerful phrase because I think it reverberates from Professor Bai's presentation this, this morning. What should we think about? Even as we accept that development is such a pivotal idea and ubiquitous all over the continent, but what is development? We never care to think that, in fact, development is a colonial coinage left behind as colonialism was receding, defining itself as a movement that had come to the continent in order to plant progress, in order to plant the transformation of the world, in order to plant processes for the transformation of humanity. Then we caught up on that idea and have never left it since. What is development? What aspect of development should philosophy address? Thus, according to Raleigh, an belief that African philosophers' mind has largely been molded by the principles of Western philosophy, he or she is still confronted by a vast number of issues that stem both from her or his encounter with global issues and from the fact that the realm of her or his experience is defined equally 
by the experiences of African peoples whose core problems also relate to traditional beliefs and modes of thought and modes of existence. On account of this dualism, the philosopher in Africa is compelled to undertake an examination of the implications of this dualism for her or his discipline and for her or his practice of that discipline with specific reference to the African situation. This is not new to African intellectuals in other disciplines, and I'm not claiming originality here. African writers and literary critics are thrust into this self-reflection by the same colonial experience, or as Mugimbe puts it, by the same colonizing European text as the philosopher was. So we need to find why the philosopher's mind continues anachronistically to be caged by the characteristics of Western themes, as well as intellectual and spiritual reason. The challenge is for all in both secular and religious worlds. And this time around, the challenge needs to be taken on in ways different from those of ethnophilosophers and ethnotheologians of the 60s and 70s. In other words, what we need is no longer a Hellenization of African thought, but the other way around, without shame or fear. The challenge is to design and teach philosophy courses in philosophy that focus on African themes and philosophers. And I'm proud to say that this past academic year, I taught a whole course for a whole academic year on Kwasi Mirebe, on his works and his thought. A very well received graduate seminar and very well attended for that matter. As a capstone, a capstone course in the department, without which seniors and graduates could not graduate. And that is important, is turning things around to emphasize the view that African philosophy can be taught anywhere, and that their texts do exist, and African philosophers have done enough to make us design courses around their works and around the ideas that they have advanced and developed. With works formerly unavailable due to language barriers, now increasingly available in translation, or French-speaking philosophers increasingly writing in English, there is more than enough to draw syllabi on. In addition to these, there are philosophical texts written in different styles in African languages from which Africa-focused courses can be taught. And my mind cannot help but point toward works such as those of the Tanzanian or then Tanganyikan thinker and writer, Shankan bin Robert, which have remained largely unknown beyond courses in African languages due to lack of interest in local intellectuals. As a result of which, they have remained untranslated locally and completely marginalized from a philosophical point of view. Where translations have been attempted, they have tended to be mistranslated because of Western bias against the idea of the possibility of indigenous African philosophers, even when they have written such powerful texts like Shaban Roberts, Utuboram Kulima, or Kusadikika, or Kufikirika, deeply philosophical texts, but which we don't see in our classrooms. Where translations have been attempted, I'm sorry, they have tended to be mistranslated because of Western bias against the idea of the possibility of, against the idea of the possibility of indigenous African philosophers. Sorry for that. Indeed, we have succumbed to the Western to the West because the West has known how to assert itself, even when it has been wrong on several issues. But we have negated ourselves even when we have, have we have had better ideas. Conf sorry, um, when we have had better, ide better ideas, even when we have had better ideas, so we will get a lot of, oh goodness me. But our failure has not been only because we have shied away from being ourselves. 
When we have tried to be self-assertive, we have done so by claiming that our ways were natural to us rather than debating issues as informed by our historical and cultural backgrounds. I do not know what is and what is not debatable or discutable in places like this. But my thought right now is that the naturalization of culture as done by, say, like I said earlier, Senghor, has not been done evenly. How, for example, does one explain to the villager why we, why we oppose their daughter's sexual orientation as a lesbian, or their son as a gay man, rather than merely claiming that these orientations are unnatural, in quotes, or that their polygamous lifestyles are condemned by God. As philosophers, we are called upon to understand life in all its expressions and absurdities. Life is never a straight line. Its confusions, its frustrations, its highs and lows, its ambiguities, and above all, its unclarities and confusions, disappointments, and achievements too. We are called upon to abandon the one box fits all explanations into which everyone must fit, which might only tell those reading us that it is our explanations or descriptions that might be distorted after all. We are, as philosophers, called upon to reflect upon life in all its facets, which may mean as it presents itself in the experiences of those who are alive and have been alive. We cannot chase away people whose experiences do not fit into our boxes. The wisdom that philosophers are called upon to love accrues only from confronting experiences in their expressive plurality. Here is what a contemporary philosopher Robert Nozick says. One form of philosophical activity feels like pushing and shoving things to fit into some fixed perimeter of specified shape. All those things lying out there, and they must fit in. You push and shove the material into the rigid area, getting it into the boundary on one side, and it bulges out on another. You run around and press in the protruding bulge, producing yet another bulge in another place. So you push and shove and clip off corners from the things so they'll fit, and you press in until finally almost everything sits and stably more or less in there. What doesn't get heaved far away so that it won't be noticed, quickly you find an angle from which it looks like an exact fit and take a snapshot. At a first shutter speed before something else bulges out too noticeably. To touch up friends, sorry, you go back to the, to the dark room, to touch up friends, bricks and tears of the fabric of the perimeter. All that remains is to publish the photograph as a representation of exact things, things as they are, which is really not the case. So the question is, why do philosophers strive to force everything into one fixed perimeter? Why not another perimeter? Or, more radically, why not leave things where they are? What does having everything within a perimeter do for us? Why do we want it so? What does it shield us from? Why does it matter? Yes, admittedly, philosophers seek not only to understand life, but to understand it in a manner that makes sense. This is not surprising and that is natural not only to philosophy, but to reason in general. This is one of the biggest challenges for the philosopher, namely that she or he devotes her or his life to understanding the nature of human existence, only to realize that she or he cannot make sense of things, and that life itself cannot be made sense of. 
Unfortunately, it is the philosopher who gets frustrated by this realization more than most people are because they just do not get to this realization or because they are not called upon to face this gargantuan task. The philosopher is afflicted by this fear, not just for him or herself, but also on behalf of others. But why shape, oh, sorry, why think and write on behalf of others? Why do philosophers think and write in impersonal fashions as if they themselves had no concerns as individuals? Why do they project their concerns about, about, upon other people? Maybe this is the vocation of reason itself. Namely, that reason speaks in the form of freed universality that engulfs all, the Cartesian res cogitans, that is. But is this not the very point that is so challenged by what we just said above? Namely, that the cogitative subject is always embodied and therefore subject to the social realities of class, race, and gender? Just as a reminder to the social historical realities of these contingencies, Charles Mills, a Jamaican born Canadian philosopher, reminds us to reflect on the contrast between what European philosophers call the social contract and what became of the historical European expansionism across the world, or race relations in racially mixed post 18th century world. His contention is that there was never a social contract in the first place, and that European philosophers, let alone the architects of the subsequent European modern state, that never imagined people different from themselves when they drew up the idea of equality in the use of reason in participating in civic duties. Rather, therefore, it was a racial contract as opposed to a social one. In the colonies and in all white led governments and social systems across the globe, black people were disenfranchised without exception, thus making a mockery of the view that the mainstream philosopher appeals only to the reason of the reader rather than to her or his needs and desires. He's a lie. Philosophers are very biased people. The days when Western perspectives were presented as if they were the ultimate truth on every matter they addressed are long gone. Like we said in the introduction, it is now, in the multicultural age we live in, obvious that every reason is only from a point of view. But there is no doubt that every reason requires a sound supporting argument. What Bertrand Russell says so well about simple things of perceptions of objects indeed applies to the more complex matters about broad-ranging matters of life and human existence in general. And after all, we, at least most of us, are here by chance, and so to think that only we would have the last word for all people and for all times would seem to be exaggerated and unwarranted glorification of ourselves and our own times. Many things don't make sense in the world of philosophy. And I think the idea that one incidental person could settle all matters of reason once and for everyone at all times is completely miscued. One day last week, a former student of mine, someone just a few years younger than I am, walked into my office at lunchtime and said he had a question to ask me. He said, there was this gay couple who wanted to wed. So they went to a baker to make them a wedding cake. But upon learning that these guys were gay, the baker declined to make the cake, citing his disapproval of that kind of behavior. What do you think about this, Dr. Masolo? He asked me. Should the baker decline to serve these guys? He asked, and I looked at him as though he came 
specifically actually with this question. Our conversation actually went very well, I think. We live in a civilized world of reason where we are expected to give sound reasons for what we believe and what we do, even if it means differing soundly with other people. The only reason I tell this story, oh, in fact, more than a, just about a week later, another student comes into my office, this time a current student. A young lady sits in my office and asks me, maybe you have seen a drop in my participation in class, and maybe a, a drop in the quality of my work this semester. And I say, you know, I just thought that you were not getting things together well, which is okay. She said, no, many things have been happening to me. One, my girlfriend and I were evicted and sued by our landlady. And after we finished that court process, and we broke up, and I nearly collapsed. I had to be treated by a psychiatrist. I was in depression. So I stood up and I hugged her and said, relations do go south sometimes. It's natural. You will find another one friend. Uh, how was I supposed to have counseled this young lady? You know, was I supposed to have gone into sudden cultural shock and collapse and die? No. I looked at her and I said, this is natural. It's okay. You will be fine. You will find another girlfriend. Come on, move on. Maybe she will come back. People do make that sometimes. The point I'm trying to make is that how could a philosopher's point of view 150 years ago have been relevant in addressing these two people's problems that we brought to my office. And I said, look, I think this is the only place that is the right place to bring such matters. Because open, open, random, open mind. Tell me what you think, tell me what you believe, tell me what you, how you live. It's okay, that is all that is natural. The choices that you make are cultural. So we repeat that statement. We live in a civilized world of reason where we are expected to give sound reasons for what we believe, even if we may differ soundly from some other people. The only reason I tell this story is that it was an improbable conversation 50 years ago, not in an office with a door wide open as is conventional policy in the place where I teach. And you don't discuss such matters in hushed voices. No, open, loudly. They occur even in the classroom. That's the perfect place to bring them up. But today they are open questions for open debate. In the classroom, in the company office, on the bus, name it. So my office was in fact even a better place than all these others. In fact, a university office or classroom would be the perfect place to have this kind of conversation. But just think of how someone 100 years ago, let alone in the 18th century, would have given his or her answer to this kind of question in the name of reason or intellect alone, for everyone and for all times. 18th century, or even just 70 years ago, is a very long time from a cultural point of view, at least when viewed from the point of view of today's speed of cultural change. So when we describe culture in racial terms, we risk doing ourselves double jeopardy. Culture is a wonderful thing, but we are likely to understand or appreciate it sufficiently when we encapsulate it into a skin. When we naturalize it beyond claiming that it is natural to have culture, because, because that is the most that one can claim with some degree of plausibility. 
And appreciating it is what makes me say that rational reflection alone cannot grasp adequately the nature of human experience in its different domains. Hence, like both Friedrich Nietzsche and Bertrand Russell once observed, a philosopher usually borrows from far more resources than he or she would like to admit. From the social and cultural milieu in which she or he happens to have grown up, she or he must be in conversation with this milieu at all times. After all, what would they be for? What would they be worth? After all, where is another if not her or his own? These are the temporal circumstances that give her or him the temperament that she or he works so hard to hide behind the excuse of reason or intellect alone. Where does all this leave us? As Wittgenstein put it, working in philosophy is really a working on oneself, on one's own interpretation, on one's way of seeing things, and what one expects of them. And to conclude with a recall of Huntwinji's remark, the body of the thinkable is immense. So, while it is true that philosophy took the leading charge in reasserting African identity, following, or as Atrix plates it in Orphenoir, in response to the history of domination, it might be time now for philosophy to rectify how self assertion is to be redirected. And that will be done to satisfaction only if philosophers direct their attention to explaining African experience as the world and the world as it is experienced by Africans themselves from an African point of view. Thank you. These young people have grown to such extent, rationally that is, that they do not leave anything unquestioned and they do not leave anything taken for granted. They do not take commands from many people. My grandson does not take commands even from his own mother. His own mother has to get him on what they call eye to eye level, eye to eye level. The mother must kneel down to get to his level so they can dialogue as opposed to talking to him from above, from a standing position. He will never accept that. Right? Now, the idea is, and I think that this is the question you are asking, at what level should we begin teaching children critical thinking? I think we do well when we start it from the earliest possible age. But at the same time, I'm not saying that we should, in fact, be so permissive that we let children do anything they want. There is a difference between the two. And the better idea is that we cultivate the right way of thinking about the world and about action. And the idea of conviction, and conviction with good grounds, that we should start teaching children at the earliest possible time. And that begins as soon as they are able to understand. Now, the, you, can, you can flesh it out in a variety of ways. It incorporates lots of other things, and it has different kinds of components, uh, which is partly, there is a day, and this is a, a, a better example from this young man. I had received books. I had received books from Amazon. And one of the books was uh, a documented uh, uh, pictures of the mummies of Egypt, right? And so I get this book, he's at home, I'm in my study, and we open the box together, and he gets attracted, he says, I like pictures, I want to see. So he opens the book, and he goes to a page, and he asks, oh, and at that point, my assistant, my graduate assistant calls me, and I'm in conversation with him, and he says, Grandpa, is this one from the ground? And I said, what do you mean from the ground? It was dug up by architects. And I said, oh, yeah, where did you learn that? 
And he says, oh, I learned it from, there is a children's program that teaches science and teaches all different kinds of scientific ideas and theories. And he says, architects dig things from the ground and they must handle them very carefully, otherwise they break. And they say, and where did you get the idea, the word architect from? He says, he mentions this program, and I said, oh my goodness. And this is the program that I always thought my grandson was wasting time watching. Yeah? No, we need not only to encourage them to think critically from as early as point as possible, but we must also be able to identify the resources that help them in order to encourage growth of knowledge from as early as possible. So long as they can understand and we help them get into that understanding more, we will be doing our children a very big favor, growing up to be responsible members of society, armed with or furnished with proper ways of thinking about the world. And then you can, you can increase the levels of some little tiny sophistication as you go along. Right? So philosophy in the family is a very good idea. And I think that that is where it should start. We normally do not start there. But it must be separated from permissibility, which can, in fact, be very much of a carelessness. It can produce unwanted results. Um, are choices rational? Yes. I want to know, to think, that each and every person who chooses, who makes a choice, makes, does so on the basis of some ground, on some basis, from some background. It may not be the best. Not all choices are made for the best reasons possible. But there are certain choices that you cannot fight with, certain choices that are purely cultural and are done if they are made by people who are mature enough to make them, I would have no quarrel with them at all. So I have no problem at all knowing that my, my student was gay or was lesbian or whatever you want to call her. I know many men, I know many men. I have very many friends who are either gay or lesbian. I have had a chair, our chair of department, who I believe was the best chair I have ever had in this place since I went there more than 20 years ago was a woman and she was gay, right? So uh, those are the choices that people make. They make them rationally, they make them for a variety of reasons. That is their orientation, that is how they feel culturally. If they make the choices as mature people, so be it, I've got no quarrel with them at all. Um, how much, so how much philosophy, how much, how much philosophy is culture? Philosophy is culture. What else could philosophy be? So the point that I have been making is that philosophy is a special type of cultural expression. It is a cultural expression that grows and thrives and lives on the basis of critical thought and does that as its main definition. Yeah? Development and Western hegemony, you know, uh, uh, what I would recommend is that you read, you read, or you, 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 you get to some history of Western philanthropy. The history of Western philanthropy. And it, this goes back, to, in fact, 1900. But it started much earlier in other parts of the world. So things like, things like the Rockefeller Foundation, things like the Ford Foundation, these are foundations that were established primarily and principally in order to steer Western programs and projects in Africa. And almost each and every Western nation has one, has an agency that catered for a variety of aspects of research uh, or development-oriented research. Development was an idea that was created in the, colonial, in the colonial time. It is not our word at all. And what it has always meant for us is precisely what these people meant for us to do, right? which was to engage in the transformation of the world as part and parcel of how African societies would be transformed. It was a transfer, if you wish, 
something that they exported in order to help Africa grow. But it was a project that was born out of the realization that colonialism was not going to last long. So they wanted some legacy to remain on even as colonialism receded. And this was part of the birth of this, of this, of these philanthropic programs. So um, the Rockefeller Foundation and Ford Foundation were born, in fact, in order to respond to problems of transformational ideas and processes in China and in India and in Southeast Asia before they were applied to Africa. Which is the reason why when these people were, in fact, receding, they left behind the so-called Institutes of Development Studies. What do they do? These are statistical departments. All they do is to draw up statistical programs and studies and researches and records in order to feed into certain ways of handling aid-oriented engagements with the developing world. But the history is very interesting. Development has never been our world. We inherited it and we have almost lived with it without modifying, without modification. How do I deal, or how do I, whether, whether or not I accept ontology's characterization of ethnophilosophy, you probably sensed uh, uh, somehow that um, given as the strict definition of ontology, ontology's strict definition of ethnophilosophy, I agree with him. Right? I agree with him. Uh, but ethnophilosophy may mean lots of other things than just that particular framework that he was so critical about. Because almost every philosophical idea, if you expand the word ethnos, uh, almost every philosophical idea has some kind of specific historical and cultural root. So to some degree, lots of every, almost every philosophical expression is, and I think that that was the idea that I was trying to expand partly towards the end of, of, of my presentation. So to some degree, some philosophical background, historical and cultural, will make every philosophical expression if not something, and that is, which is the reason why we easily identify all those uh, philosophical, somebody called them trajectories, a little you know, earlier in, in, in the day. Uh, German philosophy is quite different from the French and from uh, uh, um, Portuguese, uh, from British, from American, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So if you want to extend the word that way, yes, but we never do. Yet these are processes and systems of self-assertion in manners that draw very heavily from both the historical and the cultural legacies that these intellectual engagements have built on. What makes me miss sleep is the world that I care about, the world that makes me think, oh, that must be a problem, this must be a problem, this saying must have a sense that is deeper than what I often hear it announce or state and so on and so forth. So um, while we inherit all these influences, all what I call social, cultural and historical milieus from which we inherit how we think and what we think about. Um, what, how we think about them, what we will define as a problem is always going to be very personal, right? Which is the reason why I'm always very skeptical of people who drive philosophers to think about such grossly <coughs> defined uh, matters and ambiguities as development. What on earth is it? Why should I think about it? Only because you, my neighbor, wants, you know, thinks that it is important to you. There are many, many other things that we can engage in our own, in our own awareness of where we grew up, where we live, where we experience life in its many varieties and richnesses um, around it.